In our last episode, we closely examined the gilled cap and stem mushrooms. And when you say mushroom, it is the gilled cap and stem fungi that people generally think of. The scary mushrooms, like the destroying angels and death caps, which bring so much fear into the heart of those who do not understand how to tell poisonous from delectable fungi. And who can forget the fly agaric, which must appear in every fairy tale that has ever come out of the West. But in this episode, we'll be taking a look at the porous cap and stem fungi. In particular, those fungi whose genera are found within the order Bolitales. These fungi themselves also come in a wide variety of shapes and colors, and at times their species can be readily discerned, while at others, they are very difficult to tell one from another. And new inroads into genetic testing have revealed that many bullet mushrooms that look alike actually are genetically quite different, which only adds to their mystery and the challenges of trying to discern one from another. This makes the order Bolitales especially fascinating for blooming mycologists. And for new mushroom foragers, they are also a branch of a special interest, because while some are poisonous, and a few can be fairly poisonous, none are deadly. In fact, all the deadly poisonous mushrooms in the world are to be found among the guild mushrooms. That is not to say that none of the porous ones can make a person quite sick, and it is certainly no guarantee that a person might not have an allergic reaction. But for new foragers, they are a good and safe place to start. And their porous structure provides clues that will help us understand fungi we will study in future episodes. We'll use this Retobolitis ornotypes, more commonly known as the ornate bolete, as a model to help us understand the poured cap and stem mushrooms. Unlike the destroying angel, Amanita by Sporigera, which we studied in the last video, this mushroom is a delicious edible, as are many members of the Bolitaceae family. As noted a moment ago, it follows the traditional cap and stem shape, but the Bolitaceae family does not have gills. They have a porous underside, somewhat like a sponge, and many change color when cut or bruised. As we go through the video, we'll take a look at all these features and what they mean for identification in depth. Fundamentally, porous cap and stem mushrooms can be broken into two parts. The pileus, which is typically known as the cap, and the stipe, which for all intents and purposes is the stem of the mushroom. From there, determining species requires examining a number of identifying traits. Apart from bolitas, that is, bolete mushrooms, there are many other genera of mushrooms that have porous undersides, and not all of them follow the cap and stem morphology or form. Many form shelves or brackets, like this colorful Ganoderma suge, and these Fomes fomentarius. But for today, we're going to stick with those fungi that follow the cap and stem, or stipe and pileus morphology. And in particular, we're going to examine three related classes of mushrooms, Suilus, Lexinums, and Bolites, with the specific goal of coming to understand their various traits in order to be able to successfully identify the various species among them. Now before we move on, let me take just a moment to explain why it is so important to know the scientific names of species. This mushroom's common name is the painted bolete, but if you check your field guide, you'll see that its scientific name is Suilus spraggy, or Pictus. If you were to mistake this mushroom for one in the genus Boletus, then you would be very puzzled by your attempts to positively identify the fungus, as its identifying traits would not really quite match what you're looking for. And some of the common field tests used to see if a bullet is edible, such as cutting or bruising it to see if it turns blue, would not apply at all. And these fungi were up until the year 2008 considered to be bullets. And I remember back then pouring through field guides, struggling to positively identify their species, noting how nothing I observed seemed to quite fit with a mushroom from the genus Boletus. And then in the year 2008, a new genus was created by the scientist Jose Sutara. It was known as the Hemilexinum genus, and this mushroom, formerly known as Boletus sublagripes, was moved in 2015 to the genus Hemilexinum, becoming Hemilexinum sublagripes. And suddenly my struggles to identify this mushroom made sense, because it seemed to have traits of both Lexinums and Boletes. And recently a person commenting on another video on my channel noted that testing for blue bruising to determine edibility did not apply to birch Boletes, nor to crack cap Boletes. His argument might have made sense, had he been aware that the birch bolete scientifically is known as Lexinum scabrum, it's not in the bolete genus at all. And the mushroom, commonly known as the crack cap bolete, is scientifically known as Cerocomelis chrysanterum. Quite a mouthful, isn't it? It's also in an entirely different genus. And thus, identification traits common to boletes, suilus, and lexinums would not apply at all. Cerocomelis is a small genus in the boletaceae family, containing only some 12 species but different enough from similar looking fungi that it warrants its own genus. 
The message here is clear enough. When it comes to mushrooms, common names are confusing, and reliance upon them can lead to misunderstandings and misidentifications. It is imperative to know and use the scientific nomenclature when working with fungi. So let's set about learning how to identify the porous cap and stem mushrooms beneath the family Boletaceae. Start off by considering any cap and stem mushroom with a porous or spongy undersurface as likely among the Boletales, and then work your way toward a more specific identification. But remember to be flexible. New developments in genetic testing and a continuing growth in the understanding of mushroom morphology continues to subdivide the old Bolete, Suilis, and Lexinum genera into new groups, and your field guide may reflect that. With potential Boletes, it is typically good practice to begin with examining the stipes, or stems. On the surface of the stipe, you're going to check for scabers, glandular dots, and reticulation. Let's take a look at each one. Scabers are kind of like scales that go up and down the stipe of a mushroom. Another way of thinking about them would be as long, thin plates. And the plates end with a dark dot. These are often defining characteristics of mushrooms in the Lexinum genus. And in fact, the Lexinum shown above is Lexinum araniacum, which is also commonly known as the red-capped scaper stalk. Glandular dots are often found in mushrooms of the genus Suilus. And you might think of them as like scabers in that they have dark ends, but they don't lift away from the stipe like little scales or plates. They may be abundant or few, and some Suilus, like the Suilus braggy, incorrectly but commonly known as the painted bullet, do not have glandular dots at all. And finally, there's reticulation. And it is not unusual to find reticulation on fungi of the genus Boletus. You might think of reticulation as scars of pore development. Pores try to form along the stipe as it grows, and the growth patterns get stretched out, until they ultimately form what looks like a net-like pattern over the stipe. Reticulation might be obvious, and easily felt as a raised surface along the stipe, but reticulation can just as well be subtle so much so that it is problematic to identify whether or not it is there at all. We see this here on the stipe of this delectable Boletus adulus, the king bolete, one of the most prized of edible mushrooms. But obvious or subtle, persons working with the order Boletales must become familiar with the various types of reticulation, as it is often important in bolete identification. It is also important to take note of the stipe's shape and size. Some porous cap and stem fungi of the order Boletales might have long and slender stipes, though rarely would one see them having the pencil-thin and thinner stipes often found among mushrooms of the guild type, such as the Zentiloma quadratum. The cap and stem mushrooms of the order Boletales, even when longer, thinner, and more graceful, will as a rule also be more substantial, and often they are impressive for their robust growth, in which the stipes can be considerably more massive than the spore-bearing caps so much so that they can seem like fat bulbs wide side down into the earth. Among the order Boletales, the pileus, or cap, is just as interesting as the stipe. Let's begin by looking at how it differs from the guild mushrooms which we examined in the last episode. Guild fungi have taken the evolutionary strategy of creating plates under their caps, scientifically called lamella, and commonly gills, which bear spores. As time goes by, the spores eject from the plates, fall, and with a little luck, catch drifting air currents just underneath the pileus, and with a great deal more luck, for most spores never survive to germinate, find some place hospitable where the spore might flourish and grow, and become a new mushroom mycelium. The fungi of the order Boletales, for whatever evolutionary reason, abandoned the successful plate strategy, and instead packed spore-bearing tubes underneath their pilei. Apart from that, the tubes function in many ways similar to the guild fungi. They release spores into the air which, with a little luck, or rather, a great deal of luck, catch air currents which carry them to someplace hospitable where they may germinate. For a naturalist, mycologist, or forager, looking to identify fungi of the order Boletales, they need only look under the cap, where they will find a pore surface that looks much like a sponge. The Suilus fungi are usually distinguished by their slimy caps. The caps may not always be slimy, but are typically so if they get wet. And another distinguishing trait of Suilus fungi is they have very large pore structures that often appear arranged radially. As well, one may find a partial veil or scars of a partial veil hanging from the pileus. Generally, it is not terribly difficult to identify Suilus, except for the fact that they do not conveniently present all of these traits at the same time, and sometimes Suilus species that should have such and such a trait will not.
However, this is a genus that becomes easier to identify as one gets used to working with it. I think one of the most notable exceptions to the typical identification traits of Suilus is a beautiful one that likes to grow under eastern pines in my area. We touched upon it in the latter part of Minute 2, that troublesome mushroom known as Suilus spraggy, which simply refuses to conform to the majority of what field guides tell us should be a Suilus. Instead of a slimy cap, it is rough. It does not sport glandular dots, and the remnants of its veil is so neatly coiffed around the pileus it is nearly invisible. The one consistent Suilus clue it gives is the large pore surface beneath the pileus. Back when I considered myself an amateur mushroom hunter, I was stumped by this one. Those were the days before I understood how confusing mushroom identification could be if I did not stick with scientific nomenclature. And, being new, had a much harder time wrapping my head around the variability in the shapes and sizes of mushrooms. The pilei, or caps, of mushrooms from the genera of laxinums and boletes have much more in common with each other than they do with those of Suilus. They have porous undersides where the pore surfaces are much more compacted, sometimes nearly microscopic, than one sees in Suilus fungi, making the underside of boletes and laxinum mushrooms look like very dense sponges. Like guild mushrooms, the pilei of boletes and laxinums come in a wide variety of sizes, though generally they follow a convex or roughly convex shape. But one way that they significantly differ is sometimes the caps, especially in the genus Laxinum, can seem ridiculously small in proportion to the stipes. And indeed, one wonders, upon seeing these mushrooms, how it is they manage to make and distribute spores at all, because the very purpose of caps is spore distribution. And in particular among laxinums, it can seem that stipe growth is the goal and the distribution of spores is little more than an afterthought. One other thing that I've found is that bullied and laxinum caps are often fleshier. And because they have dense spore tubes beneath them, they can have a spongy feel from the top, like thick but somewhat pliant rubber. Often, if I encounter an unknown mushroom in the field, before I even pick it I can tell whether or not it's gilled versus something in the Bulletales family simply by flicking my finger off the cap. It's something a mushroom hunter will get used to with practice. Finally, a few mushrooms in the genus Boletus, particularly those various species, presently and confusingly mixed up in the Boletus edulis genus, share the common trait that if the caps are fresh and damp, they will feel a bit sticky, hence they are also sometimes called penny buns or honey buns. But as soon as those caps get a bit older and drier, they lose this trait, so it's not a reliable identifier. Lastly, as mentioned earlier, many mushrooms in the order Boletales emerge from veils and will carry evidence of those veils in the form of scars, or even bits of veil hanging raggedly from their pileus. Or as noted with the painted bolete, there will be evidence of the veil, but often it will look as if it was neatly trimmed off, as the mushroom developed, so much so that it takes practice to recognize there was a veil there at all. And though it is quite rare, and often subtle, the veils from which many Boletales mushrooms emerge can leave scars on the caps, appearing like tiny or large warts. And a young fungus of the order Boletales might show a complete veil beneath the pileus, entirely covering the pore structure. But you can easily confirm whether or not the mushroom is gilled or poured by peeling away the veil. And this is an extremely important distinction, since all the deadly poisonous fungi in the world are gilled. That's not to say there are no very poisonous fungi without gills, but determining whether there are gills or pores beneath the mushroom is exceedingly important. As we can see here, this Amanita bisporigera, a deadly poisonous gilled mushroom, appears to lack gills if we look underneath and forget that we are only seeing a veil. Bruising and cutting are often important methods for determining the identification of a mushroom from the order Boletales. One of the interesting traits of genus Boletus mushrooms is that all the poisonous ones will turn blue if bruised or cut. Now, there are more than a few genus Boletus mushrooms that are edible and will also turn blue, but the majority of edible boletes will not turn blue. And distinguishing boletes one from another can be quite difficult in the field. So simply bruising and cutting a bolete mushroom to see if it turns blue is a useful and fast way to determine if a bolete mushroom will be poisonous. But it is important to bear in mind that this applies only to those mushrooms of the genus Boletus. This does not apply to Suilus, Laxinums, Hemilaxinums, nor any of the other genera within the order Boletales. But fungi in the order Boletales also turn other colors. Here is a time-lapse video of a Laxinum slowly turning blue-black over a period of about 20 minutes from the time it's cut. These color changes after bruising and cutting can become important identification traits. 
Some happen fast, and they are very suitable for field identification. When I'm in the field focusing on foraging rather than mycological study, I prefer not to have to bother with the various chemicals that are used for field identification of fungi. In fact, I want to remain as light as possible, so I rarely carry them. And I do not consider carrying chemicals, nor taking a spore print, suitable identification techniques for a busy forager. For mycological study, certainly. But that is a different application where depth of information gathering is more important than staying on the move in order to quickly go about harvesting. This video should provide you with the fundamentals for identifying porous cap and stem mushrooms. Of course, there is very much more to learn. I've been studying mushrooms much of my life, and every time I go out into the woods or meadows to observe them, I find new things that I've never seen before. This should come as no surprise since it is estimated there are 5 million or more species of mushrooms in the world, many of which have never yet even been catalogued or described. The points we've gone over in this video are related to field identification. One can become more precise by bringing mushrooms into the home and making spore prints as described in the previous video, or even investing in a microscope and learning how to measure spores' colors, shapes, and sizes. But no matter how far you take your skills in the world of mushroom observation and identification, prepare to always be surprised. Mushrooms will never cease to amaze you with their striking variety of shapes and colors, their massive or minuscule sizes, and as you get deeper into studying them, their uncanny intelligence, and the way these ancient organisms have interwoven so much of the life we find here in the world. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.